to speak for about 40, 45 minutes or so because I've got quite a, a, a presentation that requires quite a bit of contextualization when speaking in a different context, such as I am here. And um, you know, what, what a wonderful turnout. Ian had led me to believe that if we were lucky, there might be about half a dozen people here, maybe more like three, or maybe just himself and me. So <laughs> thank you for giving some of your precious time. When Ian, Ian was one of my students and you know, one of my most inspiring students at the Centre for Human Ecology at the time when we were migrating, we were in Strathclyde University at that time. And I'm going to t use Ian's work as an example then. You know, I should say that this was his work back in 2007, I think it was, um, or six or thereabouts, um, 2005, whatever it was. So obviously it's not necessarily representing how he is now, but I'll be using that as an example. And I want to try and, in the short time we've got available, I want to raise some deep issues about what it means to be radical, what it means to reach to the root. We're here at the home of the Henry Doubleday Research Centre and all the work that was done by Henry Doubleday on organic farming and what have you. It's about getting down to the grassroots and even deeper to the tap root. And my field is human ecology. Um, we were discussing in the car coming along the difference between human geography and human ecology. I suppose, generally speaking, you might say that whereas the orientation of geography is spatial organisation, the orientation of human ecology is human organisation and specifically ecology as human community. And I want to look at some of the challenges that radical human ecology brings to both academia and activism, how we can inform activism, but also how it feeds back into the academy. Um, we might need to bring a chair in. Um, or s squat somewhere, or <laughs> whatever. Uh, welcome. Um, so I'd like to start with this picture, but I'm, I'm going to talk about some difficult challenges, but I want to in a way start with the end of it. And here is a, does this pointer work? Um, oh. oh, it doesn't show on this board. Don't worry, I'll use my finger. Uh, here you've got um, a picture from a celebration on egg on June the 12th last year, celebrating 20 years of community land reform on the island of Egg, which is a 3,000 hectare island off the northwest of Scotland. And on the back of the brochure here, it says the current island directors on the trust were all children at the time of the buyout. And that was music to my ears because I remember 26 years previously when we were launching the Egg Trust on the island in 1991, the island launch in October 1991, suggesting the vision that perhaps the time would come when a visitor to the island might ask who owns this island and the answer would be not some Saudi oil sheikh or some wealthy aristocrat or a racing car driver but we own it for the benefit of the community and for the heritage of the place itself and that's precisely what has come to pass but we're talking about this in the context of how do you do this kind of work in academia now I point out that if any of you here in this University of Coventry got an opportunity to do commercial consultancy work being paid, I don't know what the going rates are, 1,000 quid a day, 2,000, whatever it might be, I'm sure the university would give you every encouragement to do it. But when it comes to standing with real life communities, especially if they have no money, and saying, well, this is also a place where publicly funded academic work should be speaking to, then it can be a much more challenging thing. As it was with my work in the 1990s, I was teaching human ecology, I was directing the MSc in human ecology course at the time, and here's a cartoon in the Times Higher Education Supplement of what happened. Um, it was take your, take, your, take your child to work day, and the cartoonist is saying, take your daughter to work, get her to carry your P45 home. 
the form given when you are made unemployed, when you're made redundant. And so it tells here how Edinburgh University Centre for Human Ecology last week held a press conference. Um, Alistair McIntosh, whose post as MSc director is under threat, explained that the numbers were swelled by his teenage daughter Katrina's attendance. This was Take Your Daughter to Work Day. The annual event was intended to give young women an insight into the world of work. So Mr McIntosh said, Katrina has come along to observe the process of her dad being fired because Edinburgh University closed down the Centre for Human Ecology. Here's the editorial on the matter that the New Scientist ran on 4th May 1996, giving the opinion that overall there will be a considerable loss to the university's intellectual tradition. A tradition of fearless inquiry will be broken. So these are the kind of risks that we take. But I've already just shown you a picture from Egg going back 26 years. I'm going to be talking to you about work that goes back 40 years in my own life. And I would put it to you that if we're serious about scholarship, if we're serious about scholarship being of service to the community, then we have to enter into this with a very long-term perspective, not a short-term perspective. And I'm happy to say that Edinburgh University now has taken me back in, not on an, not on an employed basis, but as an ordinary fellow, uh, strikingly no longer in the Faculty of Science and Engineering, which is what I was in, but in the School of Divinity. And you will see why as I proceed through this. So there we are, you know, we have to roll with these things and not hold grudges, but learn from what has happened and to learn that you know, institutions also can change, especially as times change. Now, a central theme in a lot of my own work is about disconnection. Community is about connection, about relationships. That's what ecology is all about. And I draw your attention to this passage from T.S. Eliot, where he speaks in his essay on the metaphysical poets in the Times Literary Supplement of 1921, about what he calls the dissociation of sensibility, the dislocation, the disconnection of the ability to feel sensibility, the, what Ian Crichton Smith, the Hebridean poet, refers to as the feeling intelligence. And it was in Ian Crichton Smith's essay, Real People in a Real Place, that I first encountered this quote from Eliot, which says that in the 17th century, a dissociation of sensibility set in from which we have never recovered. In other words, was the advent of early modernity in Britain. While the language of the poets became more refined, the feeling became more crude, in some cases, exposing a dazzling disregard for the soul. As a human ecologist, I am concerned with matters of soul. I should say that is in my approach, and I think you see it a lot in the Scottish approach to human ecology. Not all human ecologists by any means would use such language. I consider it deeply important for reasons I'm going to unfold in this presentation, which I'm going to talk about land reform, and then I'm going to bring it round right at the end to some theoretical considerations concerning research methodology. <coughs> Eliot Sessi was about metaphysics. Metaphysics meaning meta beyond or behind physics, behind the physical. Are we just egos walking about on legs on, of meat? Or is there more to a human being? Is there more to reality? Is there such a thing as a metaphysical reality? James Frederick Ferrier, a Scottish philosopher in his Institutes of Metaphysics, uh, he's a man, incidentally, who invented the word epistemology. So the author of epistemology in this book here says metaphysics is a science of real existence. I assume real existence. I take it for granted that there is something. You can't just deconstruct it all down to text. You can't play tru post-truth that it is what I say it is. There is something. And when on occasions I encounter postmodernists who, of the type 
because of the wide range of thought in postmodernism. But when on occasions I encounter those of the type who say, and I quote, nature is just a social construction, I say, OK, let's take you up a mountain. Let's put you out in a boat in the Hebridean Sea, and we'll see how long your social construction lasts for. I take it for granted that there is something. My philosophy is Scottish to the very core, a natural growth of old Scotland soil, born and bred in the country. I put it to you that that doesn't have to apply just to Scotland. That is a statement of community of place, of connectedness to place, of connection to the qualities that place, that nature confers upon human nature. And so I come to land reform. Why is it necessary? Because part of that process of early modernity from the late 16th century onwards, particularly during the 18th and 19th century, was that land became commoditized in Scotland. In England, you had the same thing further back in history with the enclosures. I think the only difference is that most of the English have forgotten that process. Whereas with us, it is still in the folk memory because it was so very recent, as I'm going to demonstrate. There were old people alive when I was a boy who would have remembered those processes of eviction from the land. Here you are, 1885, Ian McKinnon's Island Sky, the illustrated London Weekly News showing gunboats and marines being set in, sent in to put down rent strikes in resistance to landlordism. Gunboat diplomacy deployed within the British Isles and not just Ireland as was then within the British Isles, but in Scotland also. And here you are, 1895 also, an eviction actually taking place in North Uist. And you know, when I look at Donald Trump and my recent work's been on the psychohistory of Donald Trump's maternal line, two sides of his maternal line were evicted from the land. And there's a whole lot more to it than that. And I ask what has happened in this psychohistory, this psychological history? What do people carry with them down the generations when these things are unprocessed? There is my own great-great-grandfather and grandmother from Strathconnan, Murdy McLennan and Mary Gollan with their family, taken again around 1896, I think that picture was. And Murdo's father's people were evicted from Strathconnan. And in Tom Johnson's history of the working classes of Scotland, he says they were McLennans, that side of our family. The evictions of the clan McLennan from Strathconnan by the Balfour trustees, the same Balfours whose grandson um, helped to create the state of Israel, were carried out in a most barbarous manner. And to this day, the spot is shown where the dispossessed men and women crouched together, praying rather for a merciful death than that they should be driven further from the stress from the valley of their birth. <coughs> That's what I mean by the psychohistory. I've just been touring in North Carolina and South Carolina and I say, you know, when you've got Americans with the Bible in one hand and a gun in the other and a picket fence behind their pro around their property saying we must make America great again, what is the, what, what is the source in those Scots-Irish people of the ontological insecurity that gives you such obsession with the need to make America great again? in those ways. What has gone on historically? And so in my, in, in Murdoch McLennan's case, he ended up being a catechist to the workforce who were building Dunrobin Castle in Sutherland, where some of the most brutal of the Highland clearances took place. And this is what the rich do with their money. They build their fancy castles and go and play golf and what have you. And in a nutshell, I put it to you that that's what gives us the world we have today as in this Guardian cartoon of yours and ours. 
And at the heart of that, it's a dispossession of common people, of the peasantry, from their land. That's what gives the leverage by which, you know, we're all paying rent to the usurers for our mortgages and so on. That's what happens. And this is what land reform in Scotland is trying to overcome. Now, that's me as a young man there in the bottom left. I was aged about 23 there. My wife says, whatever happened to that body? <laughs> and I only woke up from these things, not from growing up in the Hebrides on the Isle of Lewis, because we were never taught these things in our history. As one of our teachers said to me, it was not in the curriculum, and in any case, we were ashamed of it. It wasn't until I went to Papua New Guinea and people like Margaret Ogumeni on the far right there, people like her started to raise questions about development and what controlled development, that these questions grew in my own mind. And I came back to Scotland after two times, in four years in Papua New Guinea, and I realised that there was starting to be a fledgling land awareness precipitated by things like, in this case, a Bahraini sheikh evicting people so that um, he could fly his falcons and hunt rabbits over the land that had previously been farmed, and these kind of things. And then it came about that the island of Egg was up for sale. Notice the, um, the name of the vendor here, Vladi Private Islands. You couldn't make it up. Run by Farhad Vladi, an Iranian international islands broker located in Canada. Marketing our Isle of Egg in the Hebrides. Well, here's Egg, there's its location. So you, here you see the Isle of Skye where Ian is. There's the Isle of Lewis, um, which, um, wh where I was raised. I should say, incidentally, I was born in Doncaster, where my Scottish father met my English mother when, as a young doctor, he had gone to get work there. So I spent the first four years of my life not far from here in Doncaster, and my mother's people were mainly from the Birmingham area, so I'm kind of in her territory, more or less, here. But here's the geography that we're talking about. And at that time, we're talking here, 1991, the whole of Egg was owned by a wealthy car salesman, Keith Schellenberg, who was having to put it on the market because of um, issues in sorting out his third divorce. And there was a small number of indigenous people left on the island, a number of incomers who he had brought in to work on the estate, and only a population of 60 on an island that had once supported 400 or something like that, before the clearances. And you walk on egg and you walk amongst the ruins of where people had been cleared in the 19th century. And so that's me back in my Taliban days, sir. Um, basically, what happened was that one day this man in the middle, Tom Forsyth, approached me, came to the Centre for Human Ecology in spring of 1991, and he said, some of us have been talking about setting up a trust to buy egg for the community. And at one level, it was all wrong, because these were all people who don't live on egg. Liz Lyon, a Glasgow-based artist, Bob Harris, a Loch Winnoch sheep farmer, Tom, a crofter from Skorig, just north of Egg, but nobody actually from Egg. I said, where are they? And he said, well, you know, I've spoken to the gatekeepers in the community, and they can't move because of what the laird might do to them. So it needs some outside stimulus. So reluctantly, I got involved. And reluctantly, because of the question, how do you... How do you do this with legitimacy? But it was good enough for me to proceed on that key gatekeepers had given Tom the thumbs up, saying, OK, try it. What did we do? We founded, we established, we registered a charitable trust called the Isle of Egg Trust. And we launched a manifesto that drew heavily on poetry. So you've got McDermott there quoted, we are sanctuaries for birds, but not for people. And you've got Kenneth White of Geopoetics fame. There's a major three-day conference at Glasgow University next week around his work, with himself speaking at it. And if I can take a poem of White's like this as just an example of one of a number of poems we use to help legitimise and fire up our work in these early days. 
White says, I am a landowner myself after all. I have 12 acres of white silence up at the back of my skull. Whew. You see the power that gives. They say you can't eat poetry. I put it to you that poetry helps to create the realities from which we can eat. That sense of legitimacy, wherever her people have been oppressed, as Paolo Freire says, they will have internalized the mindset of the colonizer and feel a lack of legitimacy to recreate their own reality. So if you're doing this kind of work, you have to challenge frameworks of legitimacy by positing alternative frameworks, what in Scotland we speak of as claims of right. Claims of right, an important principle in bringing about our devolved parliament. So here we are, I'm jumping ahead a bit now, three years on. By this time, as you can see, the local community are wholly involved. And in fact, the original founders stood down from the trust. I was re-elected by the islanders, but otherwise it's made up mainly of islanders and one or two outsiders for the sake of skills that needed to be brought in. And what this trust is doing is it's got no money, but it's causing a disturbance in the market. Because if you're a rich man wanting to buy an island playground, do you really want to come there when the natives are restless? And what we were consciously doing was engaging in market spoiling by creating a situation where the natives were restless. Now, in doing this work and reflecting on it, and in other contexts of my work, I see three things going on here. I call it the rubric of regeneration, which involves, first of all, remembering that which has been dismembered. And I'll mention in a moment, I'm drawing that from liberation theology, where Gustavo Gutierrez, in books like The Power of the Poor in History, talks about the importance of doing history from the underside, of reclaiming a people's view of history, a social history, rather than history as is told by the victors. Then you can revision how an alternative future can be. And only then can you do the work of reclaiming what is needed to bring that about. These diagrams I had done for the wee book Rekindling Community here, which I'm going to be talking about quite a bit later on when we come to methodology in how you work with this kind of work. Now, I'm drawing very much on this, as I say, on Gustavo Gutierrez and his fundamental principle of liberation theology, that to liberate is to give life. I'm not going to talk through these just now because that's too much detail, but basically an understanding that liberation is at multiple levels. He suggests, and I, these are my labels for what he's suggesting, a social level, psychological level and spiritual level of liberation. My work has drawn very heavily on a context where I'm working in the Hebrides in communities where religion is important, but where it has tended to be fossilized in the past. And so when you do contextual theology, as it's called, what you do is you not only contextualize where, what was happening when these stories happened in the past, but you can also contextualize them into the modern day world, like these images of Adolfo Perez Esquivel here, the Argentinian Nobel Peace Prize winning artist in his Stations of the Cross, where Jesus is in the modern city and the Roman soldiers have got guns. So you're basically taking these cultural memes in people and I do the same when I'm working with Muslim communities or when I'm talking to Hindu friends or whatever. In my view, the faith doesn't matter, but you can take a tradition and you can say, well, how does that story speak to us today in our world? And Walter talked about the importance of understanding the powers that be. 
The powers that be being the interiority of power, the spirituality being how power operates on an inner level as distinct from just an outward level. And he says we must name the powers that be. Naming what they are, who they are, and how they oppress, what they do. Then we can unmask the powers that be, which is when you reveal how power causes oppression. In economic terms, in psychological terms, in spiritual terms. By spiritual I mean pertaining to the deep inner life. And the deep inner life at a level of profound interconnection between people. And only then can you engage the powers that be, which Walter emphasises from a spiritual perspective, at least a Christian perspective, as being a process of wrestling with the powers non-violently. You're not trying to destroy the powers that be, you're trying to redeem the powers that be. You're trying to transform how power operates, how power is controlled. So we're not saying there should be no land ownership. We're rather saying we need to transform the basis of land ownership because disproportionate individual land ownership, notice my emphasis on disproportionate, is injurious not only to other people living on that land but also to the heart of the landowner because disproportionate wealth distorts your social reality and therefore distorts your human relations and leads to unhappy situations. So here's a cartoon that was done of my work but it kind of, uh, it says it's a Scottish version of forelock togging, tugging your grace. Um, but the point here is feudal, lord, feudal lairds, feudal lords still control most of Scotland. And what we were doing, what the cartoons just picked up on here, is that metaphorically we were mooning to the feudal lairds. We were basically saying, we're not going to put up with this anymore. We're going to step into our own power as communities. We're going to challenge the power that you've got. We're not going to kill you. Nobody, that, to my knowledge, no landowner has ever been killed in the history of Scottish land reform. Ours is not a violent movement, but it is a movement that challenges. It challenges non-violently. And therefore, it's a slow-burning fuse rather than a fast-burning explosive one. So, after a while, the press started to get interested. As you can see, will Schellenberg be the last emperor of egg. And as the press started to get interested, things started to heat up. And here's a picture of a community meeting at which the decision was being made whether the, you know that picture I showed of all the island members being part of the trust now? The decision was being made whether to take it on board, whether to have elections and elect island people to the trust. And you can see there what a difficult meeting it is. Look at the amount of alcohol on the table. <laughs> Look at people's body language and facial expressions. Notice that the inner circle is made up of women and the outer circle of men, which is an important dynamic. And what's going on there is that the night before, Schellenberg had allegedly phoned Sheena here and said, tell them that if they have anything more to do with that trust, I will withhold consent for the old people's sheltered housing. So the decision of the meeting was that it should be put to the old people. That was done and the old people said, you just carry on, bring back the land. So sure enough, the owner responded by issuing eviction letters to those who he saw as the ringleaders on the island. He did it at a weekend. We were on the island at the time, and three of us, myself, Leslie Riddock, the journalist, and Maxwell MacLeod, um, and, uh, um, and act, how do you describe, I can't describe Maxwell. Um, the three of us, we, we, we clubbed together £160 to charter a fishing boat to take us back to the mainland and get these pictures onto the front pages or page three of the Monday morning newspapers. So whatever, basically, was being thrown at us, we reflected it back in these ways. And then once all of that started happening, the real shift started happening. So here's Angus McKinnon, island tradition bearer. 
and he's got the maps out and he's teaching the meaning of the Gaelic place names to Karen Halliwell, who is an incomer from the south of England, and Davy Robertson, who's an incomer from Easter House in Glasgow. And basically taking the view, you know, we, we all have to become indigenous now, no matter where we might be native to. And that's been an important part of how we've worked with Scottish land reform. So you harness the energy of those coming in from elsewhere, along with the indigenous energy, and try to create a situation where these things work together, with a central focus being on building community. If you're for the community, if you contribute to the community, you belong. As I put it in one of my poems, a person belongs in as much as they are willing to cherish and be cherished by this place and its peoples. Notice peoples, plural. A person belongs in as much as they are willing to cherish and be cherished by this place and its peoples. Notice the essentialism there of acknowledging place. The idea that place itself might be part of what cherishes us and requires cherishing. I'm going to come back to essentialism at the end of this presentation. So it was we got going what the Guardian called a Scottish land rights revolution. And we launched a big appeal, the Let's Crack It campaign. And we put on all kinds of interesting fundraising events with the best bands in Scotland playing, etc. And we raised £1.6 million from 10,000 donations. And I might say that 70% of those donations came from outside of Scotland, mainly from England, mainly through a big appeal put out by the English Wildlife Trusts. And we were getting letters, I remember seeing one being opened from Unemployed of London, containing two pounds and saying, it gives me hope. So we like to think that what we're doing in Scotland is a pattern and an example that can give hope elsewhere, that can wake up consciousness. And so we've now got the Land Reform Act, as it now is passed, a, a series of Land Reform Acts that, give, that confirm freedom of access so you can roam anywhere in Scotland except within people's front gardens. Uh, you don't need permission to walk over land if you're not causing damage. Um, communities have a preemptive right to buy land if it goes in the market at a government market valuation which kind of knocks a bit of a hole in speculative land values. Needless to say, not everybody is happy. The Daily Mail here getting in touch with Robert Mugabe's official spokesman, who said it seems Zimbabwe and Scotland share the same goals and ambitions when it comes to land reform. Well, we're doing it through the law. We're doing it through market processes, including market spoiling, but we're not using violence against anybody. And so that's how we come to this situation where today the island directors were all children at the time of the buyout. And you get frequent, you know, all the time the media of the, literally of the world are bombing in on egg and on other communities with land holdings. We've now got, we've now got over half a million acres out of Scotland's 19 million acres in community land tenure. That's around about 3% of Scotland's land area is under community control. And this is setting a pattern and example. It's bringing about empowerment in communities at multiple different levels. And here's um, Sarah Bowden, one of these young people who's now a young farmer being featured here in CNN News. You go to Egg and big emphasis on green living because you've got the land base from which to do it. You've got the land base from which to do it to make it meaningful. 
And so the island economy built on things like local construction companies and all kinds of small businesses, ecotourism, a microbrewery, um, high-tech homeworking and what have you. Um, they built their own electricity grid. People come from all over the world because being 14 miles out to sea, they weren't on the national grid. So uh, this is a 100 kilowatt hydro scheme there. And they've got, I think it's about 40 kilowatts of so uh, solar panels and about the same in wind turbines. And they run their own electricity system. That was a great thing in br bringing the island together because some people would still have preferred a private landowner rather than the community running it. But when it came to, do you want to be part of the electricity grid or not? Would you be happier just running your own little generator, pounding away, costing you a fortune in diesel fuel? That brought everybody on board in terms of seeing what having their own trust could achieve. And so now, as I say, literally, you get people coming from all over the world. Uh, this is a group that my wife, Varen, and I led from Papua in Indonesian New Guinea. And many of you will know the heavy history of that part of the world. And these are planning officials. We've had several visits, and we've been over there also, from the planning department and from politicians, wanting to learn how you can do this to get the land back into the hands of communities. And I'd like to point out also a slightly younger Ian McKinnon here taking part in that, and also another of our students, Sibongili Pradhan. And I want to focus now on research dynamics coming out of that. Oh yes, this is when we went to Papua in Indonesian New Guinea, uh, meeting with Mama Wanma there, one of the elders in one of the villages. This is Maria. Latu Hamino on the left here, who is one of the driving forces behind this program we've been involved with um, out in the villages here. And, you know, these people are dirt poor people. These people are in a struggle for existence, many of them. You can pick up the energy in the meeting we're having there. And notice in terms of, you know, my own use of liberation theology, in this context, both Christian, Islamic and animist. So, you know, I would literally, in some of our meetings, have a Bible out on the desk and a Quran out on the desk and a traditionally carved lime spatula for chewing betel nut that I was given in Papua New Guinea, representing the more animistic views. I would have those three things out and taking the liberation theology from whichever angle was appropriate to speak to people's faith spaces. And it's, it's them themselves, it's Alex here, the head of the planning department, who's got the Indonesian Bible out on the desk in that meeting. Now you see how this gets uncomfortable for academia. You know, this is not how academics usually do their stuff. But I would put it to you that if you don't approach people from where they come, you're not going to see where they're at. And you're not going to be able to go deep. Varen and I have had loads of people in other NGOs say, how did you get such traction in West Papua province of all places? We've been unable to get in there. And my answer is very simple. We start with the Indonesian constitution and what it says about the central place of Allah, of God there. And we come in at that level. And then we see deep and we get deep. And it leads to, literally, to changes in the provincial legislation on issues like forestry and land ownership. So back to the liberation theology. Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament scholar, talks about the need for hopeful imagination, that actions that were discernible and spoken precisely by these persons, the prophets, with their enormous prophetic imagination, these poets, they were poets, not only discerned the new actions of God, of, of deep reality, of the ground of being, that others did not discern, that others did not discern, but they wrought new actions of God by the power of their imagination, their tongues, their words, new poetic imagination evoked new realities in the community. 
That's what I've been trying to show you in this brief presentation. I've been trying to show you that at work. And, you know, here's traction going right through to the provincial head offices, the provincial governor's offices. There we are, there's me and Varen there with Alex in the middle of us. And the top officials and politicians and so on gathered around. Significant traction in getting this through. And, and they say these ideas also spreading to other parts of Indonesia. And here's one of the trips where we had them up on the Isle of Harris, and you know, that gives you the idea of what they're on about. You can see the faith mix here. The head of the delegation is a Muslim. And we had the astonishing thing at the Free Church in Kalani, you know, the, the so-called We Frees, that she, get, can you remember her name? Ian? I've, but her name has um, slipped me just now. Um, but she gave the address on the steps of the Free Church, thanking the community, and the Free Church minister closed with a prayer. It's kind of unheard of. So just back to you know, the work of Sibongili and Ian. And as expressed in Radical Human Ecology, you can find um, my own contributions on, the, on my website and Rekindling Community. I've got examples, uh, I've got copies here if any of you want a copy that expresses our students' take on things. Because when I do my work, I don't see the teaching as an inconvenience that gets in the way of research. I see my postgraduate students, the ones who are capable of it, as adjuncts to research. So I always say to them, if I'm supervising a project, let's work on this together and hopefully get a joint paper in a peer-reviewed journal out of it. I generally suggest that they work with grounded theory or variations thereof. And I do that just to cut through the methodological stuff because that allows you a multitude of approaches and it gets some thinking about methodology. They may end up with some alternative approach and they'll get into first person inquiry, second person inquiry, all of that kind of stuff, PRA approaches, you'll be familiar with all of that. But I generally, with my students, when I, when I had students of this nature, I would generally suggest that they verse themselves in this approach. I'm not going to go into that in any depth because you'll be familiar with these things. But I take it deeper than that. I say, you know, the question that is never addressed, I never see it addressed in books like these on qualitative research methodology, is what is the meaning that gives meaning to meaning? You're, you're trying to discern meaning. Well, notice that word. You're trying to discern. You, as the researcher, are not an impartial observer. You, as a researcher, your quality of being, who you are, is intrinsic to this. And so I suggest that the, the deeper approach or the deeper take on groundedness is about discernment, a word that comes from the old French and Latin, meaning dis to throw off or to separate and cerner to, to separate. Dis off and cerner to separate. To separate off, to distinguish, to see what is of meaning and what is not of meaning. And in terms of what meaning is, I often lean on T.S. Eliot's four quartets. In my view, the greatest mystical poem in the English language, where he says, all shall be well. He's echoing Julian of Norwich here, St. Julian of Norwich. All shall be well, all manner of things shall be well, she said, by the purification of the motive in the ground of our beseeching. Here I am using mysticism for research methodology. I'm saying to my student, are you purifying your motive? Why are you doing this? Is your motive pure? Do you just want to get a PhD so you can act the big shot? Or are you serving knowledge? Are you serving people? And so encourage them to purify their motive in the ground of our beseeching. What are we most deeply asking? To beseech, to deeply ask. What are we deeply asking? What is the ground of our beseeching, if we are talking about grounded theory. 
So here's Sibongili's research here. She was researching regeneration beyond land reform, a deeper engagement with community and place in the women of egg. And I'll just read you a wee bit of this. I, I, I found that when these less tangible needs, oh goodness, I found that when these less tangible needs for personal community, environmental and spiritual well-being are not met, there is not just an absence, but in fact a situation of dysfunction. In the course of identifying their unmet needs through stories of woe and strife, the women were on a journey that could transform satisfiers of fundamental human needs that failed and ended up draining life into satisfiers that enhanced it. Not got time to go more deeply into that, but you can get the gist of the depth of where Sibogili is coming from. And let's just take a deeper look at three of these women, Camille, uh, who, uh, all of these are long-term residents of Egg. Camille uh, settled as a young woman as an ethnographer trained in the Bourne in France. Maggie Fife settled when recruited by Schellenberg from the north of England originally, and she's really the matriarch of the Egg Trust. And um, Mary McKinnon here, who is indigenous to the area in the island's Catholic tradition and the spiritual anchor of the place. And we looked more closely at their and other community leaders in other communities where there's been land reform through the work of another student, Rutger Henneman here from Holland, whose research was on the spirituality and theology of Scotland's modern land reform. So it's all very well for me to spout liberation theology, but how do others see it? In the case of Egg, it's very interesting. Camille. It depends on how you define spirituality. There is a kind of green consciousness, but spirituality is not something that they can easily admit to talking about. Notice how in this context, although a very long-term resident, she goes into talking third party, they, because we were in ethnographic mode. Then Maggie here. I would say there was no spirituality involved in the buyout. The main reasons for the buyout was to get rid of the landlord but everyone has their own spirituality in a way, laughing. Perhaps there is a kind of ethos, something indefinable. After all, we're a bunch of hippies, freedom, love and peace, we're anarchists. And then Mary, the, the indigenous person, the hand of the Lord is in all the processes. The buyout is part of that. No single human being can understand his will, but still, God acts through us. There is much in the past that gave the church a bad name, but I believe in the pure religion. Religion was out all that gave the church a bad name. So there you have a very traditionalist take, but centrally important in terms of opening the gate. So there you can read, it's on my website if you want to read it, the paper that Rutger and I published in the Journal for the Study of religion, nature and culture produced by the University of Florida's Department of Religious Studies. This is what I mean about these joint publications. And, and notice, by the way, you know, the slight courtesy of putting the student's name first and the supervisor's second. So often it's the other way around. But it is just, you know, to say the least, a courtesy to respect the student in that way. And then we're talking about getting into depth. So wh what about this character here? Ian McKinnon sees us, lost leaders, issues of change and identity in a Highland community. And what I've done here is I've taken quotations from Ian's work, interviewing elders in his area of slate of the, on the Isle of Skye, most of whom, if not all, are dead now. I've taken his pictures, and when I talk about this, with, when, when with Ian's permission, I use his quotations in talks like this that I give, I match them up with images taken by the American photographer Paul Strand, who visited South Uist, which is a bit further out in the sea from the Isle of Skye. And I just match the images to help my audience to understand the character of the people we're talking about. So I'm quite clear that, you know, these are images, pictures from Paul Strand, but the contemporary quotes, the contemporary quotes gathered from Slate Isle Sky by Ian McKinnon round about 2007. 
you can put me right in the exact date in because I couldn't remember when I made these slides. So look at this kind of depth coming out of people. And I put it to you that as a researcher, you will only see depth if you yourself have developed depth and are in a journey of developing depth. You absorb a lot from your landscape and an awful lot from the people you live with. You might not be aware of it at the time, you might even scorn it, but you are absorbed in it. People were so interdependent. I just accept that. You know, this is the kind of community I also grew up in, where we lived for one another, we worked for one another, and we cared for one another. Because what you are is your community. What a statement of human ecology. And because, you know, these black and white images are maybe making you think this is all in the distant past, look at this wee lassie. And there she is today, a grown woman living in Fort William. This was in 2006 when the West Highland Free Press did a retrospective on Paul Strand's work 50 years previously. My point being that this is still in our communities. We are not too late to catch this and communicate it on, to pass the relay on, if we choose to do so. And so to the effect on the researcher, because Ian's conclusion in his entry in Rekindling Community is I feel there is a sense in which I am being reclaimed by my own from modernity. The deep, comfortable feelings of connection and love that I feel in the presence of these people is an urgent cosmic signal to grow upwards. Wow. How's that for participative research methodology? Now, some scholars would immediately say, I sent to centralism. Richard Twine here, writing an ecofeminist journal, reflecting on the work of people like Susan Griffin and Starhawk, saying it is worth bearing in mind that within academic writing, the charge of essentialism is used in a very adversarial way as an allegation of the worst crime. Why? Because certain groups like men or Nazis have used forms of essentialism to make out this is just the way it is, folks, and to force acceptance of authoritarianism. Unfortunately, I think that masks the way in which spiritually there is also essence. There is also the question of real people in a real place. There is also a question of how does the place where we come down in shape the way we are in ways that I've been looking at. And I find myself asking, can essentialism be a byword for the spiritual? And by that I mean that I think that often the kickback against essentialism is when a person committed to a materialistic mindset is uncomfortable with the spiritual. And they say, that's essentialism, as a code for saying that's spirituality. And what I've been trying to do in this presentation to you is to suggest that from a scholarly perspective that is not good enough. Because if we need to have psychological and maybe spiritual depth to see deeply into how indigenous or relatively indigenous communities work, but we reject that as essentialism, then we are missing out on a whole shaft of perception which not least in the kind of work I've been describing to you, was essential in bringing about deep change. So what is essence? What is essence? Aristotle, in the metaphysics, describes essence as a substantial reality of anything beyond which it cannot be reduced to another definition which is full of an expression. Magnificent, in a sense the opposite of reductionism. It is the essential reality by which it cannot be reduced to another definition which is fuller in expression. And Plato in the Republic draws upon his theory of the forms that the essence comprises eternally embedded qualities of both seeing and being. 
And notice the etymology of essence from essentia, which is from the Greek ousia, ousia meaning essence. I wonder if that's where they get ouzo from. You know, we started with Talisker Whiskey 20 miles from where you grew up, and now we're into the Uzu. The spirit, ha, 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 the spirit, the essence. And it's coming from the Proto-Indo-European root that you find coming through in the Sanskrit, Asmi, etc. Basic thing basic element of anything, the basic element of anything. First recorded in English in the 1650s, uh, English use of essential mid-14th century. But basically the essence of the word S coming from Uzia meaning being, but concerned with the nature of being. So without being there is no essence. Essence is the perception of being. Abraham Maslow, towards the psychology of being, in which he opened up many of these things. And I end with this slide with Kenneth White, whose conference we're having in Glasgow University next week, in which I will be talking, a bit like I've been talking to you today, about the use of his geopoetics, the poetics of the earth. And I leave you with this poem and suggest to you that this is research methodology. This is qualitative research methodology, where the question is always how, out of all the chances and changes to select the features of real significance, so as to make of the welter a world that will last, and how to order the signs and symbols so they will continue to form new patterns developing into new harmonic holes, so to keep alive in complexity and complicity with all of being. There is only poetry. Friends, I leave with you the suggestion that our epistemology needs to be not only rational of the head, but also poetic of the heart, and an engagement practically with the doing of the hand. And that is what fully participative research methodology is not only about, but also its gift to communities that seek to keep alive all of being. Thank you. <laughs>